Good evening, everyone. My name is Errol Southers. I am the director of the Safe Communities Institute at the University of Southern California. And thank you for joining us for American Skin, a conversation with Nate Parker. I just want to take a moment to recognize our co-sponsors, USC Black Alumni Association, Late Night SC, the Center for Black Cultural Student Affairs, and of course, the Safe Communities Institute. What can I tell you? I see a lot of films and this is one of the most powerful films I've seen in a long time, incredibly well acted and well scripted. And I just have to tell you as someone who spent most of his career in three law enforcement agencies, two local, Santa Monica and the Los Angeles World Airports Police and the FBI, it's nice to see a film that captures one of the reasons that I joined law enforcement was because I thought I could be part of the change for some of the things that happen inside and outside of the department. It's an incredible film. I'm not going to be a spoiler, however, but I do know you're going to enjoy this conversation. I'm humbled and honored to be able to open this forum this evening, and I'm really, really feeling special about spending some time listening to Nate and some of his cast members that were in the film and some of my colleagues who are in law enforcement. But let me just say this. What was really most powerful about that film to me was how it captured both the blackness of being in the community and dealing with the police and the police culture that exists. And, you know, I'm a 64 year old African American male. My dad gave me the talk. I gave my son the talk. And now we're going to give my grandson the talk. And I thought by this time we'd be at a state or a position in this country where we didn't have to have that talk. And you all know what I'm talking about. But let's get to the person who's going to really highlight this event for you. And that's my colleague at USC, Ms. Tensi Taylor. Tensi Taylor's from Lewisburg, North Carolina. She's a graduate of North Carolina State, Bachelor of Arts in Communication, a media, con a media concentration, and a minor in psychology. And bear with me, because whenever I introduce people, I take the time to read their bio, because they took the time to earn their bio. In 2014, she graduated from USC, became a Trojan with a Master of Education in Post-Secondary Administration and Student Affairs. Currently, we get to work with Tensi because she's the Associate Director of the USC Black Alumni Association. And we have some incredible events, and this is certainly the topper of all the ones we've had so far. She directs the Legacy Through Leadership Mentoring Program at the BAA. And I want you to know she's an author. 2016, she published her first book entitled Bullied, From Terror to Triumph, My Survival Story. In that autobiography, she recounts the physical, verbal, and emotional bullying she experienced for 13 years from students at school and how she turned that negativity into how she actually was able to make it positivity. So I'm gonna stop there. Again, I'm gonna thank you for joining us. It's gonna be an incredible evening. I'm just really, again, humbled to be your host, at least to open this program. And I'm gonna hand it off to you, Tensi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Southers, for that warm introduction. And again, thank you everybody for attending today. You are in for a special treat. When I saw the film American Skin, two words to describe it, powerfully poignant. And so I believe that you will truly enjoy today's conversation. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Our first panelist is Chief Alma Burke. She is the Assistant Chief of Operations for U USC's Department of Public Safety. As a child, she was always defending those who couldn't defend themselves, and she decided to become a police officer in the city she grew up admiring. She holds a master's degree from USC in executive leadership. Welcome, Chief Alma Burke. Our next panelist is Deputy Chief Amada Tingaridez of Los Angeles Police Department. She spent most of her youth in Watts and Southwest Los Angeles and decided to become a police officer and serve the city that her family called home, particularly following the civil unrest of 1992. She has many accomplishments and one of them being in 2015, she was named the public official of the year by Governing Magazine. In addition, she was a distinguished guest by former First Lady Michelle Obama during the State of the Union Address. Please welcome Deputy Chief Amada Tingarides. Our next panelist is Lieutenant Joseph A. Cortez, 
of the Santa Monica Police Department. He is a policing researcher, professor, and a practitioner. He received his doctorate degree from USC and education, where he conducted research on the juvenile justice system. His research provided a benchmark for policy development and curriculum for advanced police officer training. Welcome, Lieutenant Cortez. Our next panelist will be joining us a little later. He's in class right now, but his name is Shaheem Parker and he's the nephew of Nate Parker. Shaheem is an actor who is currently attending USC where he is receiving his Master of Fine Arts in acting. He is from Norfolk, Virginia. And again, he will be joining us around 5.45 p.m. Last but certainly not least is the creator of this dynamic film, Nate Parker. Nate Parker is an actor, director, and filmmaker. He has appeared in many movies such as Beyond the Light, The Great Debaters, Red, and Red Tales. He made his directorial debut with the film, The Birth of a Nation. In addition to this, he holds several philanthropic events, one of them being his own foundation, the Nate Parker Foundation. So welcome everybody. And again, thank you for your time and willingness to have this conversation today. I want to start the first question to our law enforcement. I gave a brief bio about who you are, but please share with our attendees today more about yourself and what your profession entails on a daily basis. Uh, Chief Burke, we'll start with you. Great, good evening, everybody. So a little bit about myself, I'm a first gen. A USC alum. I'm so proud and happy to be here and share this space with you today. I am in charge of uh, our operations bureau here at the Department of Public Safety, and I'm so humbled to actually be serving our USC community faculty and staff. And so part of my uh, daily operations is to manage all of our uniform personnel, all 330 of them that really provide the overall safety of our campus community. So again, thank you. Thank you, Chief Burke. Chief Amada? Yes, thank you so much. My name is Amada Tingaridis, and I currently oversee a newly created bureau called the Community Safety Partnership Bureau. This program started in 2011 with placing dedicated police officers in our public housing developments. Um, I grew up in Watts in South Los Angeles. I'm passionate about the work. I'm passionate about serving the community and really getting officers to understand the history and the culture of the communities that they're serving to build that trust and increase safety in our communities. Thank you, Chief. A Lieutenant Cortez. Thank you so much for having me here. And besides being a Lieutenant for a police department in California, I'm also an adjunct associate professor here at USC. As you said, I got my doctorate here and it's been my goal to bridge that gap between education and law enforcement. We do a, a, an incredible job training our officers and it's our time to educate our officers to know the correct decisions to make. So besides working here at USC and in law enforcement, I'm also a chairman of a research committee in an in international association of law enforcement personnel. So I'm very happy to be here to talk about the education component and to drive uh, true change here. And again, Nate, thank you very much for this film. The 360 overview of the film and of the issue is not lost on me and uh, your, your audience. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Nate, you have created this dynamic film. And my first question to you is, what was your premise for creating the film? And did the events that transpired last summer with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, were they influential in you creating this film? Well, first, thank you, Tenzi, for having me. Uh, thank you for all on, on this call, for what you do, uh, the time you're taking out to be here. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that any change we wanna see comes with the honest confrontation of the issue. So the fact that we're here actually means something. So thank you for being here. Uh, you asked about the premise or the inspiration for the film. Uh, and it's interesting because my, my nephew, who is now in attendance at USC, is in class and of course, his uh, professor said this work comes first and you can get there at this time. And, uh, and that is all I've ever uh, wanted for him. Um, the origin story of this project begins with, with my nephew Shaheem. Uh, Shaheem was with my sister in Virginia at a school that not only was the school underperforming as many of them do in our communities, uh, he was underperforming in the underperforming school. 
And I got a call asking if I could help from my sister. So um, being that I come from a family of people who uh, lean in to support as much as they can, given the resources they have, being in a better position and wanting him to have a better life. I said, absolutely. So me thinking I was taking him out of that situation into a situation where he'd have a much better opportunity to get the best education that he could get, a much better opportunity to be what I would call back then safe. Uh, I took him into my home. And, um, you know, just to give some context, this young man um, tested into the fifth grade as an eighth grader. And that is the difference uh, in the broken education system. Not that, the, the, you know, we talk about education. Uh, in my opinion, it's very difficult to not mention race because there's a very clear uh, dynamic and, and, and correlation between, you know, the school systems uh, where they're the people that have no resources and those who do. So I brought him into the school. The teacher said that they would do everything they could to catch them up, and they did. Uh, but a year after he got here, August 2014, I sat next to my son, I mean, my nephew, who I, I also call my son, um, and we witnessed uh, a Michael Brown face down, uh, his body bloating in the sun, and we're watching CNN and, and trying to reconcile uh, what I would say to him with respect to what we were watching. But before I could gather the words, he turns to me and says, Uncle Nate, if I'm riding my bike uh, from our house to school and I get pulled over by the police, what should I do? And for all of my films that deal with social justice, uh, for all of my conversations around social justice, um, I didn't have a, an answer for him that was, I believe, satisfactory. I said to him, you know, first of all, if you're in a situation where you hear those lights, they come up on you, you know, you see the lights. First thing you do is give me a call. Wherever I am, if I'm close, I'm going to try to get there. Then I said, don't call me because we don't want to get the impression that you are reaching for anything. I said, you know, first thing you need to do is slow your bike to a stop. Very, And he's tall. You've seen Shaheem. He's, you know, six foot tall. And he's been tall since he was 13. Dark skinned, beautiful boy. I said, slow yourself down. The second your feet can hit the ground, slowly raise your hands as you're turning around. Make sure he can see you eye to eye, eye contact. So he can see your humanity, he can see your youth, who he or she, whoever it is. If they tell you it's okay to put your hands down, make sure that they're, you know, connected and you're connecting them as you do it. No sudden moves. And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me like this. Like, and I realize in that moment, I'm traumatizing him. I'm robbing him of, of his innocence. Um, and in that moment, I didn't feel like a, a citizen of the greatest country in the world and all these things we tell ourselves. I felt like uh, a failed father uncle that couldn't articulate an appropriate answer for a young man that was just asking how he might survive an interaction with law enforcement. And that kind of started something in me, you know, I, no longer, you know, I brought him basically out of the frying pan and into the fire. And, uh, and I felt to myself, you know, I have to do something. So I said, I don't have an answer right now, but I'm going to get you an answer. And uh, that began the journey of writing the script of pulling together these thoughts of my research. I introduced, I mean, I interviewed, you know, dozens and dozens of people in law enforcement, some that, that were friends of mine through different interactions, children, we coached little, little league together in different things. And I wanted, I felt I needed a fresh way into dealing with what we know as an age old 400 year problem. Uh, and so that's how I kind of came to this Sydney Lamette approach of 12 Angry Men, uh, Dog Day Afternoon. What happens when we're forced into a, a, a situation where we have to do the one thing that I think can save us and that is talk to each other. Uh, and no one can hide behind a statement or hide behind a badge or hide behind anything that serves as a barrier between uh, empathy or compassion uh, or introspection uh, uh, or, or mutual respect. And that, that became the premise, really a device. You know, I don't describe this ever as a film. I describe it as a conversation that I hope leaks out into society in a way that that forces conversations um, and and touches people in a in, in a way that they can't forget about it when they turn when when the credit starts rolling. Uh, so that that was my goal and that was my inspiration. And when you see Shaheem and you hear him speak about you know growing up with me, you know I was definitely a disciplinarian, but those those years of of being afraid for him every time he left the house in those years of in the time now, I have to be honest with you, I'm afraid for him now. Now that he has you know become the one in the whatever the percent as a young black man who's now the very first uh, master's student in our whole family. I was the first to go to college. Uh, when I'm not around him and I don't have eyes on him and he's not in class, I worry for him, not so much of what neighborhood he might wander into, but more so 
that he might find himself in a situation where programming uh, might take his life. Wow, wow, very deep. Thank you for sharing that, Nate. And I wanna start getting into the film. And so there are several themes that are permeated throughout the film and I'll discuss on them throughout tonight's event. But I wanna start with this one. In the film, there's a lot of culture of us versus them, the police officers versus the victims. And this was actually very well done. But what happens when an officer breaks rank with other officers in, in uh, with the police department? So Lieutenant Cortez, Chief Burke, Deputy Chief Amada, how does that typically happen? I wanna make sure um, I understand the definition of uh, breaks rank. Do you mean when they identify an issue or a concern and come forward and bring light to it and the ramifications that may have with within um, a division or a unit? Yes, yes. Um, so I, I, I think first, it's important to talk about, um, you know, truth and think about the purpose and the meaning on why people become police officers. And I think, I know my motivation was after the Rodney King incident and really wanting to be a female black and go back to the black community to build trust and relationships. And at that same time, I knew that, you know, there was a big drug war and gang war going on in the community that I grew up with and that broke my heart. And so I was very um, emphatic on representing my community and, and going back to my community and trying to heal that mistrust between law enforcement and the community, but also address some of the violence and um, social ills that riddled my community. Some of those things Nate talked about, you know, the, the, the lack of jobs, there's a food desert, the lack of socioeconomic development in our, in our communities, the vacant lots that had burned down after the riots that are still vacant in our communities. So as a police officer, when you see something that's just not right, um, it is your duty to do something about it, to intervene. And sometimes it takes courage. It is a male dominated field um, there sometimes is group think, um, but when you have the courage to step forward and say that something isn't right, as a leader, you set a tone. You send a message to the community that you're being transparent, that you saw something that may not have been right, and you stop that action and you're going to do something about it. And you also empower the community to feel like they can discuss a concern or talk about the way that they were treated and not feel negative ramifications for it. Just to piggyback on what Amato was saying in regards to the trust that you build and being so passionate about law enforcement. And you touched upon a couple of things, Imada, in regards to being a woman in a very male dominated profession and really stepping out and really setting the tone for our community and representing the people that we are here for. I can share with you on the USC side with Department of Public Safety, when I first got here, we had a group of students that were just emphatically upset about the way a stop went, for example, and bringing in those students and being in soft clothes and just making sure we have a dialogue and a conversation about their experience and acknowledging how they felt, you know, and really educating our officers so the next time that they have to encounter a group of students that are not from this area, that are not well versed as to what policies and procedures are, that we serve them and that we are in the process of always learning from them. So I, I, when I watch this movie, Nate, you really touched upon a lot of things that we have to work consistently at building that trust. So that duty to report, that exists every single day. And it starts with our leadership and it starts with people that are in this room. And I, I think there's other questions as well that are gonna come up with this. Um, but we speak about this and I'm very blessed to have come from an organization that uh, really walked the talk. And it starts with the organization and the leadership within that organization. Um, <clears throat> stepping forward, 
stepping out with the, the individuals who are out policing our community is very important. But it's even more important that those leaders are out in our community as well and getting a sense of the, or getting a pulse check on not just the community leaders, but those who are just in our communities. And so one of the things that we, we talk about, and I see one of the questions is, is about the holding people accountable for if they do something wrong. Um, that's the, the, the walking the talk that we, we preach and we try to embed into the culture of organizations, not just mine, but as we teach throughout every organization. Uh, the, the stepping forward in understanding that yes, there is a way to go about talking about this or bringing it to light before it gets to something that is so over the top that we are having criminal actions happening out there. So it's winning every day, earning your badge every day. And that is start from the culture. And I'm proud to say that I come from an organization that, that preaches that and lives it. And so that, that's, uh, that's where I think the, the foundation starts from. Excellent. And hearing each of you speak, you mentioned about trust, building the trust within the community and the communities that you serve. What are some things that you do individually as well as your departments collectively to show your community members to build that trust that they can come to you, that they won't face racial profiling or discriminatory behavior? How do you continue to build that trust? Trust is, is first, it's, it's earned. And you cannot have trust if you don't have a relationship. And in our community, specifically in our communities of color, who have had uh, negative interactions with law enforcement, whether it have been 40 years ago or two days ago, their feelings and those interactions stick with our community. And first and foremost, we have to understand that trauma and what that interaction means to that individual. And we have to listen and we have to understand each other. And we have to be willing to go through a truth and reconciliation process, listening and saying, I hear you. I may not agree with you, but I hear you. And I am sorry that this or that happened to you. When you can apologize and understand and have a mutual respect, then you can have that breakthrough and start building that trust. That trust is so fragile and you have to continually work at it. And that trust is in many forms. It's by us being transparent. It's by us, you know, in the, the program that I oversee, placing dedicated officers in a community that come from that community. Officers who either came from foster care, officers that grew up in the community, officers that grew up in single family homes, officers that are in the community that can relate um, and build relationships and the community can see people that look like them. When you build that trust and you have that transparency, then you have a relationship. And when something does go wrong or there is an officer involved shooting, you have enough respect and mutual respect for one another to sit down and have a conversation about that and to, and to work through it. Can I, can I jump in for a moment? <clears throat> and thank you for saying that, uh, Officer. I, when we talk about, you know, trust and mistrust, I think it's important to acknowledge that the narrative that has perpetuated this mistrust isn't just, didn't just start with, you know, George Floyd or didn't just start with Breonna Taylor. We're talking about a people that has been bombed and intimidated and traumatized uh, for 400 years. You know, we know the, the history, anyone that knows the history of the law enforcement, uh, it goes way back well before the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it, it goes back to a time where we were being policed by patty rollers and the patty rollers were patrolling and their job was to keep us on the plantation. And when we know that there's a histor historical context if we can acknowledge that, because that's the honest confrontation part, what you talk about is truth and reconciliation. Anytime we've seen truth and reconciliation work, it's only worked because there's been a, a broad and granular confrontation 
with our past and what we're dealing with. And what I found, even in, in you know, when I've uh, interviewed law enforcement, and I interviewed a lot of, of, of individuals, and they all spoke basically on the condition of anonymity. Uh, actually, Tony Espinoza, his parents were, law, were, were police officers, the, the kid that played my son. So I had everywhere I turned, I was able to get it from the horse's mouth. You know, I said, when law enforcement, when they see this, for all their feelings, they have to understand that this is, this is not me making it up. This is not some biased, politicized stunt. This is from the, the, the mouths of those who are in the field. These words, these feelings, uh, these fears, um, these, this, this programming. And, and that's what I want to touch on. And I'd love for some of the officers here to, to kind of comment on. What we're talking about here, I think it goes well beyond a bad decision in the moment. Um, I think it speaks to programming. I went to school for pro uh, computer programming. I graduated with a degree in management science and information systems. And I remember I had a professor who would always say the same thing. You know, if we came to him and said, this program isn't executing, uh, you know, something's wrong. He said, well, whatever it's doing or not doing, you're pro you programmed it. So if it's, if it's failing at a certain line of code, you have to find that line of code. You have to fix that line of code because once you fix it and push execute, the program will perform. And as a programmer, looking at the crisis that we're dealing with, what I'm seeing in, with my eyes as a black man in America, what, I'm see, what I've found in my research is that there is a programming problem that supersedes the in the moment uh, split second decision. There's an idea that these law enforcement officials, a lot of them have been programming, programmed to see us in them. You know, I had to ask a, 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 a member of law enforcement told me, he said, you know, you have to understand, Nate, when we are in a nice neighborhood, we do what's called administrative policing. You know, it's how are you, sir? How are you, ma'am? Thank you. You're welcome. He said, but when we're in like, you know, we go south and we're in the jungle, we're, you're like, okay, those guys are trying to kill us. Those guys hate us. It's criminal policing. It's, you know, you have a warrant, get the fuck out of the car, get, the, get on the curb. And, and you don't understand, like, it, in, in those situations, kill or be killed. And I'm like, you, you lost me because to say they and to paint an entire community with that brush based on your, because this is someone that I believe is not a bad person. I think he's a good man. I know how he deals with his, I know the husband he is to his wife. I know the father he is to his son. But these, these words shockingly came out of his mouth and they came out of his mouth in such a casual way. Like you don't understand, this is what we face every day. So I wonder how much of it is programming, code that needs to be fixed as opposed to just, that was a bad shooting, that isolated incident, that, yes, that guy made a bonehead decision, that guy's a bad apple. For, on a federal level, on a, on a national level, how much of it is programming that needs to be effectively dealt with on a line of code by line of code uh, 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 stance as we, as we look to kind of get to that place of reconciliation? And you touched up on, I mean, this is by far uh, the one of the, most comprehensive movies I've ever seen where you touched up on everyone's feelings, right? And you really humanize that. And you talk about the programming and how we have to humanize our profession. And sometimes there are people that are programmed a certain way and us as leaders. And I had the honor and pleasure to work with Imada when we worked with Community Safety Partnership. And it was that you had to walk a footbeat and be engaged with our community and understand what their needs were. And then really get an officer to have a perspective of like, this is, this is the poorest of the communities we will ever see. It is heartbreaking. They need us. And to have that ability to provide that training and that constant enhancement of their ability to understand who we serve. It's the same here at USC. I'll tell you, I am so proud to be around the, the officers that I have the pleasure of working with because they really understand who we serve and who we're part of and they listen. And I think that's also it's incumbent upon us as leaders to consistently do it ourselves, to walk a footbeat, to say the hello. And Nate, you brought up a great point about seeing our officers as human, but also being able to be that closely connected and we're doing that here and I like I said I'm so proud to see that and I hate to use the word programming because they are already doing that but I've seen what you're talking about I really have but I, I'm very very 
optimistic and always have been, and Imada knows this, I really believe in the efforts that our law enforcement partners have really made throughout the past 10 years. And Imada has been really at the, the forefront of a lot of that progress as well. Nate, I, I wanted to thank you. Thank you, Alma. Uh, I wanted to also, you, you said something in about six months ago, um, our chief of police had all of our command staff officers um, go to a training. And the training was taught by a historian. And he talked about the slave patrols and our history and the African-American history. And these were for captains, commanders, assistant chiefs and chiefs. And the, the conversations that occurred after that training um, were things that I've never even been asked in my 26 years on the LAPD. And the, the bewilderment by some of my colleagues about the slave patrols and paddy wagon and what that meant. But to, to be able to have us as law enforcement sit and listen and hear that history and bring in someone outside of law enforcement to, to teach us. When we recruit, we recruit from different states, from different cities, individuals that may not understand the culture of some of the communities. And it starts with our history. And if I'm a young police officer and I can understand what occurred in this community and that I may not be seeing maliciousness from this young black child, but fear because of what he's seen and what he has heard or what he saw his dad or his brother or his cousin go through, then I may pause for a second and empathize with that young child and de-escalate and communicate and tell him why I'm here. What is my purpose for the stop? I think that it is so important that we as law enforcement um, think about our uniform and our presence. And sometimes the impact just alone without me saying a word has on that person. And don't take it personal. Understand this is a physical, um, spiritual uh, response from a community that's been hurt and that doesn't trust. And when we can peel back the layers and, and start with our history and bring in community to train our recruits and bring in the outside into our programming, then I think we'll have a better understanding and dialogue and address the fears that the community has for law enforcement. And Nate, I, you use the word programming and I, I immediately started to smile and started to love where this conversation is going because that conversation has been heading where I wanna make a actual pivot and put us into a direction that we can look at what we're educating our officers to do. In California, I will say, especially in Southern California, LA County area, we have some of the highest, you know, highest trained police officers out there. They have great training programs. I'm trying to make a career of education. So when we get into the academy, a lot of times is what we've seen is when there needs to be extra training, we'll just give it to them in the academy because there's, there's a budget issue. There's a way we can make sure we get that to them, but they don't have the context. They don't have the ability to process what it means. What, what's implicit bias? What do you mean? I, I don't, I'm not biased. I don't know what that is or, okay, I'm listening, but I don't really understand how to apply it. So what, the Little Hoover Commission in California is doing and where I testified is that we need to look at how we're educating our officers. Much to uh, the, the deputy chief and the assistant chief uh, talked about is start, instead of the word programming, start to, that education piece so we can recognize with, with context what's going on. And, and I'll give you an example in San Jose, uh, the former San Jose police chief, Eddie Garcia, who's now the Dallas police chief has a program in their academy that brings in a professor, I believe it's Professor Greg Wood um, from San Jose um, University, San Jose State University. And they go through everything that uh, the deputy chief was just talking about. But that is exactly where we need to, to capture them. Where is their, their mindset of the policing career field? Right then and there versus training them just and putting a lot of information down into them, we need to then 
progress into their careers. I, again, have been very fortunate to work in an organization that understood the need to have community members come into our advanced officer training, which I wish it was called advanced officer education, to then go forward and give us the perspective. I never grew up in the community that I served. I served a community prior to where I'm at now that was uh, not white and, and what, what it primarily white. And so I didn't understand. So I had to ask, I had to ask about the culture. It was Arcadia actually. So is that, that culture, I didn't understand the culture. I wanted to know, so I didn't offend anyone. But that, that's when I started to realize we need to uh, bring in that edu education component. So we've had a lot of very uh, in engaged leaders at my organization have went off to become police chiefs, uh, deputy chiefs outside of state, and they're spreading that to where their organizations are. And I'm proud of that. But I really think that when it comes to the post of police officer standards and training, is to bring in, much like uh, uh, the deputy chief said, is to bring in educators, bridge that gap between education and law enforcement. And I'm very proud here at Bovard College at, at USC, that master's program that we teach in is doing that. We love the fact that there are law enforcement professionals and those outside the criminal justice field that then can come together and have those conversations and give the perspective of not just police training. So. It's a great conversation. I really hope we can push this forward into some action. Excellent, excellent remarks, everybody. Thank you. And I wanna to touch on another theme and, and something that you all just shared specifically about implicit bias. In one scene of the movie, um, there's no accountability that's taken. It was the police officers were saying, well, if uh, Lincoln hadn't been speeding, then we wouldn't have had to pull him over. If he had his registration card updated, then we wouldn't have had to do all of these things. It was the onus kept being on Lincoln and his son. And instead of the officers taking accountability for the fact that they truly were racially profiling them, where exactly when the son KJ brings out his cell phone to start recording and the police officer offers to Mike pulls out his gun and he said he did it because he felt threatened where exactly was the threat? As police officers, where was the threat? And was it justified? And why, what do we need to do to get more police officers to look at themselves internally and to have this training and this education to see that just because someone is black or brown doesn't necessarily mean that they're causing trouble. Uh, when, you, when you wrote that, and then you wrote in the trial when uh, I believe it was Officer Randall said, I was scared, man, I was scared. Why didn't you take that one step forward and say, what were you scared of? I thought that was like, I really think that that was uh, an area I was like really excited for and, and it got the message across, but I wanted to see what your, your thought process was on that. Well, may maybe I, um, maybe it was assumed, but uh, the fear of the black body, the fear, fear of black skin out of context of sports and entertainment uh, is something that if you talk to anyone that, that is black is something that is constant. Um, when I'm walking down the street and, you know, and I've been pulled over a, a, a ton of times. And actually, you know, when we talk to Shaheen, we can talk about his experience. The idea that the, the very being of a darker pigment implies threat is a constant. That is something we know to be true. It's something that is, that is what the education that you're talking about is working to combat. So when he said, I was scared he was reaching for something, I think that if that would have been a white kid, there's oftentimes benefit of the doubt because there's proximity to people who look like that. When you pull over someone that looks like your uncle and you're reminded of your uncle, I think it's instinctual to say, okay, well, John, whatever, Doe, uh, you know, what were you doing? Whereas when you see someone who, and we talked about this in the film, who reminds you of rap music and how you feel about it, who reminds you basically of your disconnect uh, because we're afraid of things that we don't know. So the idea that he, he, he assumed that he'd reached for something, but and reacted on that goes back to programming. Because again, you know, if, if, if I walk past a house on my way to school and every day a dog runs up to that gate and I'm afraid and I have a trauma that has been passed down to me because of my, the history of my people in this, in this country and my perspective towards dogs, all the education in the world won't change my instinct to be afraid. That is what we're dealing with in our community when it comes to law enforcement. And I think that there's a certain level of uh, area of law enforcement that feels similarly 
when they're introduced to, to confrontation as they may see it with black skin. The way they approach the car with their hand maybe a little closer to their gun, the way they may unbutton their, the button over the gun just in case something goes wrong. And the reality is I'm not pulling this out of air. Of all of my interviews, the police just said, all colors said, Nate, anyone that tells you that has been in law enforcement for a certain amount of time that they have not profiled anyone or they don't profile, they're not telling the truth. They said, you're, tra you're taught to trust your gut. He said, there are certain times when you go, people are going to academy and they say, forget everything you've learned. So then if you forget everything you learned, then all you know is what you're being told. And if what you're being told is to trust your gut and you're trusting your gut is based on implicit bias, that implicit bias is based on 23 years of living in a, 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 a system that is designed by and thrives on white supremacy, then those things are ingrained. And you don't have that split second to say, what am I afraid of? In fact, it doesn't matter all that matters is to fight or flight, you've made a decision in that moment to escalate. And as I learned from law, law officers, once the gun is out, it's out. Once you feel like you're in danger, you feel like, you, it's not like, oh, it's a phone, I'm cool. It's now I'm stuck because of my training. You know, so it's, it's I made that decision because that was one of the assumptions I'd made about the reality of being black and white or being black and non-black and being in that situation. And they, you touch up on like experience, you know, when you talk about, you know, an officer's response, you know, it also goes to how many times have they experienced someone that is armed. Mm -hmm. So that also goes into that mindset of have I experienced someone in a situation because I, I found it, I wanted to ask you that you chose a traffic stop, which I also found to be, you know, powerful that, um, you know, we would, we would actually um, touch on that, but it also reaches the, the core of someone that has spent a lot of time out in the field, learning behaviors, learning about people, that it's not always just about that, but more about, wow, I've made a hundred gun arrests this year, and this is the behavior that was displayed on that day. But I will touch up on, and I think this is also important, is that when I watched it, I, I wanted to ask too, what was the threat to? But because of the way you wrote it and the way it was documented, I, I had I had questions. And because also you also take a look at body worn footage is only two dimensional, but an officer's feeling and perception and the person that they're encountering is three dimensional, right? So those are some things that you you really captured that. And I, and I wanna say how powerful that is on the two perspectives um, because you are training to respond because of your experience. And the other part is you're trained in the academy and then you're also, you know, you go out in the field and they say, forget everything you learned in the academy. And I think if everybody's shaking their head, that's also true because you also learn real life experiences depending on where you work and, and, and who you encounter because you could have such a great community and you could deal with such amazing people and it's going to take that one person that hurt you that day and that that's going to stay in your brain, like you said, Nate, and that'll create those memories and that muscle memory for you to react the way that you do as well. Right. And, and I think you're absolutely right. And I'll add to that. Sometimes it's you being hurt, but sometimes it's you hearing of someone else hurt. Because I talked to cops that said, you know, well, there was this time, you know, um, or a friend of mine, uh, you know, was, was one of the people who was killed trying to protect her partner. And all of those Black Lives Matter uh, protesters stopped the, the, uh, uh, um, this video footage of the, they stopping the ambulance from getting the hospital. They wanted the police to die. And you know what I thought that day? Fuck them. Excuse my language. I'm just kind of, you know, but seeing how toxic it is to, er to everyone, you know, and I told this particular officer, I said, but you have the gun and you're, a, a, and you're in service. But to him, it was a very real emotional response to a brotherhood, to a culture that he had just jumped in for hook, line, and, and, sinker, and sinker. And again, I don't bring all this up to debate around semantics. I bring it up to say, I don't think it's fair. Me personally, I don't think it's fair to say that one cop is a bad apple. That one cop is obviously a bad person. That one cop is an idiot. That one cop needs to go to jail. Let's clap our hands when he's arrested. Let's clap our hands again when he is convicted and clap our hands if he gets 50 years and gets put under the jail. Because if we're right that training is a part of it, culture is a part of it, programming is a part of it, 
then the next person that goes into those shoes could make the same mistake. So the question is, what are the systemic changes we can make? Because those systemic changes will not only save the life of the, the, the man or woman that was killed, the Breonna Taylors, the George Floyds, the Armand Arbors, they'll also save that cop from having to be in that situation, programmed or trained or whatever the word you wanna call it, to feel that fear, to escalate and to make a decision that for whatever reason puts him in that, that, that situation as well. So as you said, you know, L Lieutenant Cortez, I do think it's important as we craft a, a path forward, it is one that thinks of systemic change rather than making sure we weed out the bad apples because I do think there are good apples that make bad decisions and to just put them in the bad apple barrel rather than looking at the, the system that kind of educates programs and, and pushes them out into the world is a, is a great mistake. And, and, so, and, that's my nephew right there, but go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. And, and thank you so much for bringing that up because I asked that specific question mm -hmm. because it gets to the point that I, I really want to hammer home into all those law enforcement leaders who are on this, uh, on, on this webinar who, or who will watch it later on. Right. It is, you, you talked, I was trained to do X, Y, or Z, mm -hmm. where I want to get the education and then the reach back, where you just said, throw everything you just learned at the academy. Well, okay. I, I have heard that statement many times, uh, both in literature and, and in the real world. Mm -hmm. However, if it is a career mm -hmm. of education where you can have those vicarious interactions, because that is how we deal with issues, we talk about them, and then we what went right, what went wrong, and then we get those vicarious interactions. But that also happens from media, social media, and all that. So what I want to do is to make sure that we do not lose touch with community, but mm -hmm. with also the education going forward. Yes, you can say you're out of the academy, but guess what? Every couple throughout your whole career, you are consistently educating yourself by not only law enforcement leaders or trainers, but the community, and then having those dialogues where you have more context. And so when you brought that, when I, I asked that question, because I really think you're hitting home, yes, I, I understood what you were, you were assuming the audience knew. I wanted to hear, okay, what can we do about it? And that's exactly what I think we can do about it, is continuing that ongoing education. And I know that it is very hard to do as a manager or an executive in a law enforcement uh, organization. Mm -hmm. However, this is what this is the time. This is where we need to start getting funding for and getting mandates for because the way, like you said, it could be the one, I'm not scared about the one person who really truly is a really really bad person and has nefarious intentions. Mm -hmm. That person is. It is what, like you said, it's a person who goes out and doesn't realize that they are going down a path or they are made, they're making decisions based on their gut versus what the community, what the, what the education is telling them. Absolutely. And then what this forum presents for all of us is an opportunity to be transparent, to talk about all of the factors um, that we saw play out in your movie that creates that dialogue. And because that conversation, whether we agree or disagree, it really brings us together to have a mutual understanding and respect. So I think, you know, I, I would love to show this to every single officer and, you know, community member for us to even, you know, kind of start that dialogue. Like, what does this mean to you? You know, because I often ask our students here, what does safety mean to you? Because I'm in service of you. So what, what does that mean? And how can I provide that because I have such incredible public servants here that are ready to be responsive to those needs. Excellent, thank you, Chief Burke. And this is a perfect segue, Shaheem, Nate's nephew has just arrived. I know I told everybody that you were in class, academics come first. So again, thank you for joining us. But I want you to have a moment to tell the attendees about yourself. How did it feel to know that you were the premise behind your uncle creating this film and just maybe share some experiences where you have dealt with law enforcement and, and how you felt in those moments. Okay, well, uh, hi, I'm Shaheem, everyone. And uh, yeah, I just got out of class. I have been in California for about nine years now, nine to 10 years, coming on a decade. And initially I moved in with my uncle Nate to you know pursue a better education because I was in a, um, a tougher spot because we're all from Norfolk, Virginia and things are a bit tougher over there, especially the area we were living in. 
So my uncle saw that I needed help and that I was struggling and thought I was a good person, thankfully, and uh, decided to move me in with him to California, which was very, 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 very foreign to me. I didn't know what was what, I didn't know what Pasadena was. It was really, it was really exuberating. But um, I went to San Marino High School because he coached wrestling there. So he was able to get me in. I'm sure he's told you about it. He was able to get me in on a permit because he worked for the school. And it's one of the best schools in the country. So I got the blessing to be able to receive a prestigious education at a high school that you can't go to unless you live in the community. And then if you live in the community, houses are at least a million to two million or lots of million dollars for the houses. So um, it that's that's been my journey. And I wrestled as, as long, and he wrestled as well, or he coached wrestling. Um, and then I started doing, I started doing theater. I started acting throughout my junior and senior year, which he initially discouraged, but he couldn't turn me away from it. So um, he knows how hard it is. So I've really had the ability to gain a lot of knowledge and, and and a sense of who I am from him and being able to, while being able to live with him at the same time. Uh, how I felt about being the, the seed of this entire film, if it's a enormous blessing, it's incredible. Because you don't, when you have parents who go to work, you know, usually their work is, if it's a general job or if you're not entirely sure what they're up to, it, you kind of just think they're contributing to the world in their own way. And and if someone's a, a, a doctor, a lawyer, they're helping other people. But it's it's not often that your parent gets to intertwine their work with you in your life. They're not able to express themselves artistically using you. So it's really, it's really interesting. I kept watching the movie and I kept hearing a lot of things that I said in real life. So someone knows me royalties or something, cause I, <laughs> I was I, I he was quoting me, and it was inc it was incredible to watch from an outside perspective with a different point of reference, and um, yeah, it, it's incredible. It's nothing less than fantastic. Now, you, usually in a in the environment I grew up in in San Marino, it was higher class. I, I believe the city is majority. Uh, Caucasian and Asian. So there aren't a lot of people of color in the high school. There aren't a lot of people, at least when I was going there. So I've had different, I've had a different experience with the environment in general and as well as the police. Because in, when I was living in Virginia, everyone was taught to be scared of the police and everything like that. But I get to a community where everyone's, it's, it's welcome that they're, that they're here to help it. It, it confused me and it, it, it kind of messed with my, you know, equilibrium of thinking like what, what is good and what is bad? You know, how do I feel about this? How do I feel about that? I think uh, a key thing that I, I could take from Uncle Nate teaching me is that I was the only black kid or one of two black kids in my entire grade in a high school that had his own district. I was one of two black kids. So he taught me that they don't, they live in a bubble and they don't know what black people act like or how they are outside of this bubble because they never get to see them. The only impression they get of black people are from TV or from the media, from radio, from songs, wherever they can get it because that's the only thing they have. So you are a representation of all of those people, of all of us. When they look at you and see how you act, they're gonna assume that's how everyone else acts. So I had to take that, I had to take that with a grain of sugar instead of salt. And I had to really try to interpret that into how I lived my life throughout this prestigious community where I know I'm still in danger, even though I'm in a better situation than I was in before. So when I um, when I when, when I graduated, I came back to visit to to visit a friend who lived in the city. And when I lived in the city, when he lived in the city, I would visit his house. I didn't have a car at this time, so I would visit the house and wait for an Uber or wait for someone to pick me up. That's usually how I, what, I got around and, and hung out with my friends. And with, within moments of me coming outside of my house one time, I think it was on San Marino Avenue particularly, 
I was approached by a uh, officer of the law and I was around dusk, around five or six o'clock. I remember it like it was yesterday. He pulled the car up to me and asked me what I was doing there. And I told him I was just visiting a friend. He asked me if where I was going and I, was, I told him I was going to another friend's house, which was true. And he was asking me all these minimalistic questions about what I was doing, where I was from. He asked me for my name. I gave him Shy Parker because everyone knows me as Shy Parker. That's my name. I also identify as Shaheen, but Shy Parker is usually what I go by. And I don't, I, I, I didn't know how much trouble I was potentially in. All I knew in the moment was the the internal anger I felt because I was being profiled or or whatever term you can use in that situation. So after he asked me for a, after he asked me for my ID and for everything, I told him I didn't have my ID because I forgot my ID was in my backpack. So I was like, if, even if I check, I don't want to have to risk reaching in my bag and giving him an excuse because I was told that you have to come home. You, the justice is happening everywhere and it's great to take a stand, but when it comes to your life, you have to come home. So I didn't reach in my bag. I told him my name, Shai Parker, which is actually Shaheem. I assume he was looking it up on some type of computer or something because he didn't believe me. So he cuffed me and put me in the back of the vehicle. Now, after he found out that he searched my bag, looked into my ID, looked at my ID, checked me, I had no history, I think that's what that's why he let me go. He told me afterwards, he was like, there have been a lot of burglaries in the area and you fit the description. And of of course I knew I fit the description. I, I figured that's why I figured that's why he stopped me in the first place. But no matter how no matter how many times this happens and no matter how many no matter how low my expectations are of a situation like that, I can't help but still be upset because it's it shouldn't be it shouldn't be happening in the first place. So that that was my that's been my experience, one of my bigger experiences at least. And um I I, will, I was always taught that when people look at me and they don't have enough experience with other people of color, they're gonna assume I act like what I act I act like what everyone else acts like. So when it comes to police officers and in and law enforcement, I always make it a point to say hello or say what's up to try to humanize us so they can look at us and see us as per people, you know, because all it takes, and you heard it in the movie, all it takes is a second. Mm -hmm. All it takes is a second for uh, for someone to decide whether someone lives or die or or whether they should protect themselves in their, in their point of reference. So if I can give, you know, law, officers of the law that second to think that when they met me, someone who looks like me may be similar to me, then that would be worth it. So that that's been my experience so far, and that's that's kind of how I go about it. I don't think I would like in a situation where I would like someone's in the car and I'm in the car with someone else. I just try to. I I don't think I'd take out my phone because I wouldn't want to reach for anything. I'm trying to get home. I'm trying to stay alive, and I also want to humanize us and give us not a reason to have to reach for anything at all. Because sometimes sometimes things just go haywire, and only thing you can control is yourself. So that that's that's where uh that's that's a lot of what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Shaheem. I appreciate your vulnerability, your transparency. I'm sorry that that happened to you. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing and um, continue blessings to you. The chat is just on fire right now. We have so many great questions. So we're going to segue into the Q and A portion. Um, if you have not had a chance to put your question in the chat please do so now. Note that there are more than 120 people here in today's webinar, so we will not get to everybody's question. We will try to get to as many as possible, but again, we welcome your conversation. So the first question is, if one of the other police officers had pushed the officer from George Floyd, would he have been fired or disciplined? And whoever wants to answer that, please do. That's a, a very good question. And um, it's a hard one to answer because I'm not from that, that law enforcement agency, but um, wrong is wrong. And if someone feels compelled to step up and step in to change a behavior that they know is wrong, then they shouldn't be punished for that. 
Um, I think that um, had someone done that, um, if they were fired, I'm going to go back to what Nate talked about. Then the programming is seriously flawed. And the expectation is that every single officer has reverence for human life and that we humanize each other and we see each other. And my expectation and the, the, the leadership of our law enforcement agencies should set the expectation that when you see something wrong, you shall do something about it. And so if someone had decided to push that officer away, they should be applauded for those actions and stepping forward and intervening for something that wasn't right. And if you take a look at um, Derek Chauvin is on trial right now, and I could tell you from the law enforcement community, not one individual, not one officer can say that what he did that day was right. He murdered George Floyd. We all agree on that. Every agency for the most part that I know of here in Southern California has a duty to intervene. And that is part of the makeup here in Southern California. We also have AB 392 that was enacted in January of 2020, where it talks about our use of force policy and what that means here. So I think for us, and I know Joseph Cortez will really tap into this, is that we've done so much to train and educate and debrief and show those videos. What would you do in this instant? Because you have to talk about it. And I think that's what's important is that we have to continue the progress through talking and dialogue of those incidents because all of us can say, we're not gonna Monday night quarterback that incident, but let's talk about what would you do? What would this group do if you had that same situation? How would you as a supervisor, as a leader, or as a senior officer, what would you have done in that instant? You have to ask those tough questions. And, and Shaheem, I want to just touch back to what you said about your incident. Thank you so much for sharing that one. And it gets to one of my points too, is how we need to teach and educate officers that every interaction is an opportunity to learn. So I had a, uh, a, uh, a boss several years ago. He's now the chief of, I believe, Redmond, Washington Police Department, Daryl Lowe, who, who taught me about the interactions with people. If you have a negative interaction with someone based on what you truly believe to be a suspect, you truly believe that that is the person who just committed a crime and it turns out not to be, it is very important that you show that empathy and you start to educate them as much as learn from them. And that is something that we need to consistently talk about in law enforcement because vicarious interactions for the negative can also be true for the positive. And that is what I believe Alma is talking about as well. Uh, the duty to intercede. We, uh, my HC has had that in our policy for several years. And you would get fired if you didn't do something. You would be held accountable. I don't know if fired, sorry. You would be held accountable. You'd be uh, put up in internal investigation. But as well as being able to have those conversations, that's why the sergeant rank, the lieutenant rank is so very important. But most, mostly the training officers and those sergeants to go through and put people on the spot. How would you interact? These conversations are all opportunities to learn and then be able to put it forward. So I know as someone maybe who's never been in that situation, I now have something to draw upon and go forward. But there is a lot of uh, research out there about the uh, education and the uh, vicarious interactions. But, I have, so, a, question. Yes, yeah. yes, I have a question. And to be honest, that was the first time, you know, uh, and, and, you know, talking to Shaheem and telling him we're going to do this, you know, I never knew about this stop that happened with him. Um, probably better I didn't know because uh, something would have been turned upside down. I, I, and, and I say that to say, we, we, you know, I mentioned profiling and something that, and as I said, I, speak, I spoke to all, it was, it was one of my questions to the law officers. And I'd say 90% of them 
said without hesitation that most police officers profile. Uh, if this is true, and I and I believe it to be true because I believe the research, you know, these are people who spoke on under condition of anonymity. What is being done in the education and the training and the deprogramming, debugging, whatever, to really stop the interaction before it starts? Because we know when we're talking about Michael Brown, when we're talking about Breonna Taylor, when we're talking about George Floyd, the 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 inception or the the the, the starting point was where the flaw, the greatest flaw was, you know, um, how, do, how do we, or how do you, you know, and specifically, I guess maybe I'm talking to you, Lieutenant Cortez, it is Lieutenant, correct? Yeah, um, what do you believe is, uh, is, I'm gonna give you two questions, one for you and one for everyone. And I'm sorry, I know there's questions in the chat, but I really would like to know what is being done to, I guess I don't wanna say criminalize, um, profiling, but maybe I'll say it. What is being done to criminalize profiling? Stopping a young 18 year old kid because he fits a description, which is wrong. You know, um, we don't have to get into to, to policy, but it, it is absolutely wrong. What is being done to criminalize that act to the point that there's being not, not only people aren't, you know, officers aren't only being reprimanded uh, because look, if my nephew was so scared or terrified that he ran um, and he's already look, being looked at as a person of interest, uh, as we've seen from body cam footage, even as of late, as of in you know Pasadena a couple of days ago or wherever you want to go, um, he could have been killed. You know, I would have gotten that call. So I, I guess I would love to know, you know, as we're dealing with the education program, what is being done specifically at the starting point um, where cop, you know, law enforcement is being trained uh, on the laws of engagement when it comes to profiling anyone. Oh, and the second question, which is for everyone. Another constant I got from everyone, every single person I, I spoke to in law enforcement, at some point they talk about getting home, uh, which if you're thinking of from the outside looking in, from the standpoint of police service, which is you know baseline for law enforcement, um, where does how do we get rid of that cultural pillar? Because if my job is to serve, but the only thing I'm thinking of when I'm going to that door is getting home, um, then two things are happening at once that are working against each other. I, I feel from, from, from my question, and, and, and again, it's not attack at all. I just love to hear from those who are in the field every day and those who are actually doing the work to write, to kind of right these wrongs. So it's two questions, um, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. So I'll go back to that first question about what's being done. And I, I'm a, a data individual, I love data. And we were not doing a very good job of collecting that data. How many people are being stopped of race, color, gender, ethnicity, all, all of the data that is now required by law. Mm -hmm. We are now, we're taking those professional steps to capture that data and then be able to have policies and practices in place to review data as well as body worn camera footage, as well as car video footage to understand our officers. We'll go back to the President Obama's 21st century policing, the six pillars. And when we, when we start looking at the building trust and, and, and legitimacy in law enforcement, well, that takes us knowing ourselves and knowing what we are truly doing versus what we hear we're doing in the field. Mm -hmm. So we can go out and we can talk to individuals, but now we're collecting data to understand what is the number of stops? Is what we're doing uh, in line with what our re data is showing us? Is our strategy based on sound logic, evidence, and data? And so we're, we're really being able to look at ourselves as well as utilize the, the training and education portion to so officers know why. They understand the why. Why are you collecting this data? Why is this to become an issue? Why are you reviewing my body camera? Why are you reviewing on a routine basis and, and out so we can understand who our individuals are? And we will go into more of an appreciative inquiry into, hey, you know, what's going right in, in, that, in that sense? So I don't want to sound like I'm dodging into to criminalize profiling because, you know, in a way, some people will will try to find ways 
much to your point in the, in the video, to justify what they're doing. And that is where truly education in the ranks of supervisors and above to understand that what our officers are doing, being able to have those touch points, those learning interactions with them to be, well, I see you're making a lot of stops on this or that, and then be able to have that continuous training. So I, I hope that that kind of gives a sense of where we don't want to just jump off uh, or go into some sort of, you know, class or some sort of, we're going to do it this way. I really appreciate the approach to slow it down. The good idea fairies are out there and I really want to slow it down, get data to then be able to identify those officers who are out in the field. And I understand that some will say I work in a, this sort of community or that, and it's all relative. Those who are being educated to look at it and to understand the data will then be able to report out and change strategy. And that's our jobs as management and above to, to really do that. And, I hope that answers your question. It, 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 it kind of does. I'm going to kind of follow up and kind of put you on the spot a bit. So if hypothetically speaking, the data suggests that racial profiling is real and we can agree that racial profiling has led to the killing of people, you know, specifically in this situation, uh, black people, black men, black women, you know, whatever age, uh, should there be a more aggressive stance when it comes to criminalizing the act of profiling someone based on race, if the data suggests that that is indeed happening, and it's and it's a hypothetical, um, but I, I would love, I would love your opinion. Yeah, and and I and I love these conversations. This is where we we truly try to understand and get get a little further down the road, because if I go into a, in an in area that, because you're looking at a, a macro version of the profiling. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, I wish it was really easy to say, yes, we need to, but that would be a, an insincere or not a full answer. I, I don't want to give you that. I want to look at the, the micro. I really think that these departments truly need to look at themselves. Yes. And then it's not the criminalizing, uh, in my words of, what we need to do with those officers is to one, pull them off the streets and then look at the severity of what they are doing, retrain, or we need to somehow uh, remove them from the powers of law enforcement, but also let people know why and, and, and understand. So I think a macro versus a micro, it, it really is a big, big topic to, to say, we're going to make this a, a, felony to profile. Well, if you're saying I'm, I'm profiling at that big level, and, and I can honestly say that, that I, I believe that there's profiling out there. Mm -hmm. And some will make justification saying, like you said in your film, everyone in this neighborhood is this, and these are the people who are doing this. You know, that, and that really is that conversation, that 360, I love when we started getting to the trial and we started to see what are they saying? You might not agree with it, but you're hearing what they're saying. And now we can move the conversation forward. So I, I don't have a specific answer to say, we, what can we do to criminalize all profiling in, in, the, in the United States or international law enforcement? Uh, but I definitely think that our managers and above need to be held accountable to the actions of their officers. And with that accountability will come the, the identification of problem officers. Early understanding of the problem will help us going forward. I, I wanted to add a little bit to that. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I, I'm sure all of you guys remember the Rampart scandal. Yep. We had officers that were gang officers going into the community, planting guns, planting narcotics, and shooting individuals. And that's what led the Los Angeles Police Department into a consent decree, where we had a federal monitor literally opening up our books, looking at our practices, and, and we were under, under the gun, no pun, pun intended. And out of that consent decree, an, an early warning system was created within the LAPD, a Teams 2 system. 
and we would document how many uses of force an officer got in, how many complaints um, an officer was involved in, um, what did those uses of force look like, uh, monitoring digital link car video to see the demeanor and the attitude of those police officers. And if an officer um, had gotten in a certain amount of uses of force, it triggers a threshold. And that causes a supervisor to have to unpack that officer's history and look at everything he's doing to include sitting down and saying, you had an attitude, what was going on here? Or bringing that community member in for a conflict resolution and maybe the officer saying, you know what, I was rude to you that day. Um, my wife's pregnant, I'm waiting for the phone call, I'm sorry. And that, that community gets that apology from that, that police officer. But that being under that consent decree, forcing our organization to implement these, these uh, systems and these changes within law enforcement was huge. And then to throw in the body-worn video, I watch body-worn video all the time. And I look at officers' demeanor, how they talk to someone, why they talk to someone. We have filled data cards so every single stop that an officer makes they have to identify the race, the reason that they pulled them over, and then we just added another category to that. Anytime an officer points his weapon at an individual, we want to know why. So we are, we are constantly looking at ways to evaluate the officer's actions and their response and how they're working in the community. And then I want to answer your second part of uh, changing this, we have to go home. Um, I will tell you, my husband was on LAPD for 39 years, and he came on the LAPD in 1980. And I will never forget an incident that he went to where an individual was standing in the middle of the street, and he had a shotgun, and he was shooting at people that were in a bar. And he turned and he shot at my husband. And the bullets went through his car door, and by the grace of God, my husband wasn't killed. But he... he he would tell you, I needed to get home that night. And the actions that he took to protect himself and protect the individuals that this suspect was shooting at was utilizing his weapon. And so I think when officers say, I need to get home, I'm a mom with six children. I've worked my entire career in South LA. I have a black son who's 21. I've had the talk. I've talked about don't drive with your hoodie. I've had to sit down and have those deep conversations and I am a police officer. And so the fear is real. What Shaheen talked about is real. And I say all that to say, it is important for everybody to go home. For the person that I may have done a traffic stop on who ran a red light, his safety or her safety is just as important as mine. And again, it's about overcoming the fear of us fearing someone that looks different than I do, really understanding the community and not being afraid to engage with people that are different than you. I have a question. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like going off on these tangents. Um, you said something that I just want to clarify because I really want to know. You spoke about your husband and I'm also glad that he, he, he made it home to you. Do you think there's an added responsibility, an added danger that police should accept in oh. their role as being police officers um, that would separate them from the public that they're serving in the sense that I don't know if I agree in, in this, I say this in, in love and respect, I don't know if I believe that it is as much, uh, it is equal on, you know, a police officer and a public a person of the public or citizen getting home, um, that, it, that, that there's an equal type of, um, uh, responsibility on both sides. I, I don't, and I, and I don't think so because you have a you have a gun, and that that citizen you're not sure if he does, and and, and you, when you accept the job, and this is and again I only say this because my nephew I have my nephew right here, and if I'm telling my nephew he can't wear a hoodie while he drives, and my reasoning is because a cop might be afraid because he wants to go home that is problematic, mm -hmm. so I think that, and maybe I'm wrong, but I I respect. You know, the, the, the danger that a law enforcement person might put, you know, might have to put themselves in. But that's a reason why, you know, I'm not a police officer. 
because mm-hmm. I, I didn't sign up for that. I don't. I, I have. I will not sign up to not make it home, or to even put myself in a position where I might not make it home to to Shaheen. That's a decision I've made. That's what makes you brave that you've made that decision. So I think, and maybe you know, I don't know. Maybe you, you, you just an answer in the question, but I'd love you to speak to that. Do you truly believe that you have much of a right to get home as the public person that you're serving? Um, and, and I ask that within the context of you telling your son not to wear a hoodie when he drives a car, because those things are antithetical. Yes, and so I will tell you, I've been a police officer for 26 years and I have never been involved in an officer involved shooting. And my husband did close to 40 years and he had that one incident where someone was shooting at him. And there are hundreds of thousands of police officers who's never used their gun. And I think it's so important when we have these conversations with law enforcement is that we we are balanced and that we understand each side. I absolutely knew when I took the oath and decided to become a police officer that I was saying, I'm going to go back and work in my community, the black community, understanding that there's an inherent danger that may come with that. And that is the career that I choose. I'm not the hero and I shouldn't be, no one should bow down to me because I have a gun and a badge. I am human. I put on my pants just like everybody else. And so I believe that it is incumbent upon all of us to understand the dangers when we talk about the recent increase, LA City is up 163% in victim shot and they're black and brown people from my community being shot and killed. And it hurts me, it hurts. And if I'm a police officer attempting to work and I am working in these communities and seeing this gang crime and going to these homicide scenes and hugging the moms and understanding the dangers that are there. I went to a classroom a few years back of sixth graders and the teacher asked the sixth graders, who in this classroom knows someone that has been shot or killed? And every single sixth grader raised their hand. And that is not acceptable either. And where is, where is the breakdown where our people are killing each other And then the responsibility lies on law enforcement. We have to hold so many other individuals accountable. Our our social systems, our mental health systems, our re-entry. If I'm coming out of prison and I did my time, I need a safety net. I need to get a driver's license. I need to get job, job training. I need to become a leader in my community. And where are the resources and the breakdown for that? And I'm not making excuses to turn things away from law enforcement. What I'm saying is this, we all have to reinvest back into our communities. And that reinvestment is looking for intervention workers like the Game Reduction and Youth Development, the guys that aren't police officers that don't have a gun, that are walking those streets and getting brothers to put down those guns and getting brothers, giving them a hammer instead of a gun and trying to address that conflict we need to reinvest in programs and systems like that and stop having law enforcement have to respond to things that really we shouldn't be. If someone's experiencing a mental health crisis, I'm not a mental health worker. Why can't we refund the community and bring people on board that can deal with that so it's less confrontation for me and I feel like I have to utilize my gun to address someone who's having a mental health crisis. And so reverence for human life and serving the community is at the forefront of every police officer. And that is why they took the oath to do that, to serve and protect our communities. And when we lose that reverence for human life, then we should not be a police officer. But it's just important to me for my son and the people I come in contact to go home as it is for me to go home as well. Yes, thank you so much, Deputy Chief Amada. And we are coming up at the end, but before we conclude, I wanna ask each of you one last question. Again, I continue to hear the theme of coming home safely. For my law enforcement, what advice, suggestions, tips, strategies 
would you have, especially for black, indigenous, and people of color about how they can get home safely when interacting with law enforcement? And then for Shaheem and Nate, whatever final words you wanna share about your experiences, about your film, and keep in mind, this is just the beginning. We wanna to continue to have conversations like this because that is how things can truly begin to, where change can become effective. So uh, law enforcement, I'll let you take that and then Shaheem and Nate will, will close you out. When you take a look at, you know, and you, you keep saying the theme is going home safely. And, and, and Imada, thank you for touching on that because the reality of it is it's mutual respect. You know, um, you, Nate, you, you touched upon the fact that you have to spend so much time educating Shaheem and making sure that he understands, hey, put your hands up, talk to the officer, make eye contact. I always tell everybody, you humanize our profession and you humanize the people you interact with by making eye contact, by saying hello, by connecting right away. That is something that we, we are intentional and purposeful when we're dealing with our students and our, you know, our community here. I, I also want to touch upon the fact that, you know, we use public safety instead of the term police. I think that's important because it goes more towards service. I hope that at some point that also creates that pivot of change within our community. Um, so that's really what it means um, on my, with my opinion in regards to going home. It's that mutual respect and understanding each other um, at the end of the day. Uh, I will just go a little bit uh, further and say, um, not just get home safely or get home. It, it's just to live safely and not just the mutual respect, because I will not sit here and say that there hasn't been people who feel disrespected by either side, but primarily law enforcement, they feel disrespected for the reason they're being stopped. But I want them to understand that much to what you have talked about in the film, what you've expressed here, it is tomorrow is made for those getaway today. It's what I tell uh, the officers in the training from the get-go. Remember, tomorrow is made for those getaway today. That doesn't have to be so emotionally involved that we have to be that warrior. We have to be that, well, we're more of a guardian. So when it comes to what uh, Alma was saying is, is to recognize that this out here is not the place that we're going to make our point and we're going to uh, ultimately win the fight. And it, there's a lot you can do by making sure that you understand, identify what and who you're talking with and then uh, have a reach back or a touch point back with the supervisor later. Officer Amada, I, I don't want to speak over you if you're going to speak. Oh, no, I, I think I covered it. I think oh, I, 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 I want to respect no, no, sir. Go. Um, okay. It's you, sir. <laughs> All right. I, I will say this. I think there's a really big difference between humanizing and traumatizing. And we must be careful that we are not saying that the way forward is to teach people how to be violated or to teach people of a certain community to have to go further than others would have to go to survive. And I'm not saying you're saying it. I'm just saying we must be careful um, because we're, we're playing with the highest stakes, right? Life. And I think if we're all being honest, we will admit that some people have a better, uh, better odds at making it out of a police encounter than others, regardless of what their behavior is, you know, and not to politicize this, but I will say that I was discouraged when specifically not to politicize, but in the capital situation, I saw that police officers do know how to have restraint. And that speaks to, to, to implicit bias, that, that speaks to programming, uh, that speaks to all the things that we've been talking about. I think we have to be very, very, very careful not to put all of our eggs in the basket of teaching black people how to be, uh, how to kind of uh, dehumanize themselves in order for a cop or a police officer or a public servant to feel safe. I think that there is an, 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 uh, a responsibility that has to be taken on by the the public servant to serve in such a way that me as a citizen doesn't have to denigrate myself to a position to make someone comfortable with dealing with me, you know? And I say that, and, and, and I, and I, and, 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 and Officer Alma, I, I don't say that to speak against what you're saying. I just say in addition to, because, you know, whether I make eye contact with a, with a person or not, I'm still a citizen of the United States of America. 
if whether whether I scream at or disrespect an officer or not, so the sort of citizen, none of those things are a death sentence. So I think that we have to be very careful as we arm our young people, specifically our young black men and women, with what they might need to survive encounters with people who being are being paid by them to protect them. So and I, so I go further in saying a lot of what we're talking about as we think about our way forward is on you all. It just is. Um, and, and that's what you signed up for. I'm, I'm looking at some of the most educated, experienced people in the, in, in, in the, in the field, uh, people who are, we are relying upon to make certain decisions and push certain agendas and to, to walk things all the way up the three branches that will make us, us safe, to make our, our families safer, uh, to make our, 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 our citizens, whether they look like us or not, more safe when they come into contact with people who are charged the responsibility of, like you said, Lieutenant, making it to the next day, surviving to the next day. You know, uh, we've been doing all we can. You know, you think of, you know, 400 years of having to survive uh, trauma, having to survive white supremacy, having to su su survive racial terror. Uh, but we are in a very unique situation here, an opportunity, I would even say, that you all have the keys. And not only do you have the keys to the car that'll take us to a place that we will have a, a different kind of freedom. You also have been blessed with a moment that is unprecedented when it comes to our sensitivity to what is actually happening. So, you know, in closing, you know, my, my parting words to, to you is understand that this is life or death. Our freedom is tied to your freedom. If we can't be free, you won't be free from this either. We have to deal with this trauma in a way that is not charity. It's not a one person teach one but it is all hands on deck to restructure, tear down and build back up the type of society we wanna pass down to our children and our children's children. We should not be dealing with this. You know, Shaheem should not be having to have a talk with his children. He just shouldn't if we've done our job. So, you know, I would just say thank you for making yourself vulnerable emotionally, professionally uh, to questions that are hard and doing it, you know, on a public forum. Um, but I, I will just say that I'm counting on you to take these, the, these issues and this crisis as serious as I am and, and as I am with my, my son, nephew, uh, that is on this call that remains in danger even from the moment he hangs up this, this, this call and decides to go somewhere, more so than others, you know, not to, to make it negative, but the reality is reality. So uh, I believe it's all hands on deck. I thank you guys for being on this call. I thank you for your contribution. I thank you for holding yourselves and your colleagues accountable. Uh, and and I, I'm optimistic. I have no choice. I, I, have, I have more children. Thank you. I think it's extremely important that we're having this conversation now. And I think it's extremely productive that we're able to get together as law enforcement and community and to be able to openly communicate the problems we have and how we can prevent future ones. You know, you can't chop a tree down by ripping off the branches. You have to start at the base. But we can't be the only ones mm -hmm we can't be the only ones reaching out. The only, it, it, can't, it can't be too late. It can't be after you reaching out to us, can't be after one of our relatives is six feet deep in the ground. Mm -hmm. This has to be an open channel and it has to be a consistent open channel. Right. Because the more you know, the more, you, the more information you have to process, the more you can think, the better decisions you can make. Mm -hmm. Because no matter, no matter what type of people we are, how, how our interaction is, the stakes are extremely high and they'll always be that high. As long as you have a gun or anything that can harm us or anything, we can harm you with. It. So this needs to happen more, mm -hmm. it, it, 10 times more. Mm -hmm. And it can't just come from us. Mm -hmm. And that, that's all I have to say. Thank you for having me on here. Thank you for being on here. It's late. It's mm -hmm. getting dark as you can see in my room. I, I'm gonna ask one thing. Um, uh, Officer Imada and Officer Alma, you guys are at USC, right? I'm at USC, so Shaheem, I cannot wait to meet you because we're going to continue this dialogue, but Imada's at the Los Angeles Police Department. Oh, okay, and, and Officer um, Cortez, you are a professor uh, uh, doing a, uh, um, not a residency, but uh, doing work at USC, correct? I am. One of the deliverables that we may be able to set up, and Tinsley's probably the greatest person at follow-up I've ever met in my entire life, but after this call at some point, maybe there are opportunities to, to establish some type of town hall, student law enforcement thing at USC, uh, because we all know where USC is positioned geographically. We all know 
the community surrounding the school. We all know the disparity and the wealth gap and all the issues. Uh, but I think it might be great to have for this to be a moment of, of engagement and creating something that can kind of outlive this conversation with respect to Shaheem, who is a student that is a miracle, a walking miracle in the sense that he's come from where he's come, where he's come from and he's getting his MBA at USC uh, and the work that you all are doing. Maybe there's something to be done with this young person um, and you all that could create some type of a legacy moment. So the film, you know, and I'd offer the film to anyone, you know, to, to, to you all to use in the way you could, you know, we have a study guide, you know, we've shown for the Center for Police Policing Equity. Um, we've done all these things with the film, but maybe there's a there's a, a teaching moment, you know, with respect to education, Lieutenant Cortez, uh, and, and an opportunity here to create some type of legacy where Shaheen can be involved, Long can be involved, and the community uh, with respect to, to, to USC can be made safer through some type of thing that can live beyond this call. I think that would be really cool. I absolutely agree. At the graduate level in criminal justice would be a great, if through Bovard, I teach there as well as through Price. I've authored a class, PPD 342, Crime and Public Policy. How does crime impact policy? How does policy impact crime? And that would be a great, those two areas would be great to keep this going every single semester. I'm involved. I'm, I'm there. My hand is up. You need me, call me. I'll come in if the world's opened up enough or we can Zoom it, uh, do whatever we have to do. Very well, nice. Excellent. Excellent. You know, I'll follow up with that, Nate, and make it happen. And again, thank you all so much. If you have not had a chance to check out American Skin, it is available on Amazon. And even if you have checked it out, watch it again, because as I said earlier, it is powerfully poignant. I want to thank all of our panelists today, uh, Chief Alma Burke, Deputy Chief Amada Tingarides, uh, Lieutenant Jose Joseph Cortez, Nate Parker, and Shaheen Parker for your vulnerability, your transparency, everything that you did today. And I've been getting uh, comments in the chat. They want a part two, part three, part four. So we're going to continue this conversation because it is very much needed. So again, everybody, please stay safe. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events. Take care. Thank you.